the American view was not so new back in 17 and 73. It has roots that run back to Genesis 1 and all through history. So give me your ear if you care to hear the plan for liberty. It covers the span since time began and it's true for you and me. A tyrannical king is a terrible thing our fathers had to pay. But they declared with the faith they shared Law comes from a higher place I'm singing the American view I'm bringing the American view There is a God On behalf of Institute on the Constitution, this is co-founder Michael Anthony Perucha, along with our president, Jake McCauley. By the grace of God, and thanks to your vision and your generosity over the years, the Institute on the Constitution has been able to significantly expand its outreach throughout the country. For example, IOTC has successfully recruited and trained more than 50 chapter leaders and over 80 active teachers, covering every state in the country. Many of our leaders teach classes in their communities and churches. Others volunteer and speak in public school classrooms. Our curriculum is also used in many home and private schools with the goal of reinvigorating the American culture with an understanding and appreciation of its own history and a commitment to pass on the divine blessings of liberty to future generations of Americans. We want to continue to create an atmosphere in America where high school students are familiar with the American documents of freedom as well as the biblical foundations from which they are derived and where students display an appreciation of their constitutional heritage, which is broader and deeper than their knowledge of the Kardashians. Where students' knowledge of God's authority and reverence for his moral law is manifested in every pursuit. And regrettably, modern public education has jettisoned the acknowledgement of God and his authority and has denigrated the memory of the Founding Fathers with predictable results. According to a 2017 national survey by the Annenberg Public Policy, 37% of those surveyed could not name any of the rights guaranteed under the First Amendment. Not one! Only 26% can name all three branches of government, and only 15% of those surveyed could name the freedom of religion. The Institute on the Constitution urgently needs and requests your continued prayers in this battle that is upon us. We are committed and equipped and ready. And when we enter the fight righteously, we win every time we fight. Our current financial needs are modest but pressing. If you have already made a contribution, we want to personally thank you on behalf of the countless Americans you send us to. If you're currently praying about your commitment, please consider a one-time or a monthly donation that will aid us in our efforts. As always, we pledge to you our sincere resolve and the commitment of our own resources to the restoration of biblically-based constitutional government and the restoration of the American Republic. This is Michael Anthony Peruca, founder, and Jake McCauley, president of the Institute on the Constitution, bringing you the, the American, American View. Yeah. 
What, what form? Uh, what form of government do we have in the United States? What form of government do we have in the United States? We have a democracy. Democracy. Democracy? Uh, um, democracy? Democracy. Would I be surprised to find that we don't have a democracy? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, I would be surprised. I would be very surprised. Ooh, when was the last time I said the pledge? Hmm. When's the last time I said the Pledge of Allegiance? About eight years ago. Oh, probably a year ago. Probably 21 years ago. Do I remember the words? Uh, I think I do. I pledge, pledge, of pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States of America. And to the public. For which it stands. To the, and to the what? The public. And to the what? Republic. 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 The Republic. That's right. And we are a republic. Uh -huh. Republic. Republic. Oh, the republic. <laughs> the difference. What is the difference between a democracy and a republic? What is the difference between a republic and a democracy? I can't remember the spell. Jeez, that's a good question. Don't know the answer. Oh, good lord. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> you got me there. I don't know the answer to that. Our rights come from him, he is the author of the law. He created governments to secure those rights for us all. But when civil government gets all twisted and bent... Here at the Institute on the Constitution, our mission is to restore the Constitutional Republic through grassroots education. And that means we need you, our members, to help us accomplish this mission. Now, when you become a member, you receive all of our courses and extra materials in an online portal for a tax-deductible donation of your choice. This starts at just $10 a month and goes up from there. Or you can become an annual member for a one-time donation of $250. Now, when I consider the economic ramifications of just $10 a month, we're not even talking about a meal at Chick-fil-A anymore thanks to post-COVID hyperinflated economy here in the United States of America. But I'll tell you what, we have managed to go down on our prices. And that $10 stretches across all 50 states and re-educates and reactivates Americans to start thinking American. It goes a long way is what I'm saying. And you're helping us build that grassroots army across this country. Now let's get back to your membership and what it includes, but it's not limited to. Things like our United States Constitution course, or our Sheriff and the Citizens course. You're also going to have access to your very own state Constitution course when it becomes available. Other perks include 10% off all physical products on our store for the lifetime of your membership. Access to our incentive program, where you earn points while you study. You can turn in these points to earn prizes, like gift cards t-shirts and things like that. You also have access to our host and instructor materials that you can use to start teaching our courses in your community or your church. New additional membership perks are produced every single month and all new members will receive our brand new American View bookmark. Now this metal bookmark is symbolic of the American view of law and government and is a perfect daily reminder of our mission to restore the Republic Thank you so much for joining the Institute on the Constitution team. So click the link below and sign up to become a member today. Thank you. And God bless you.
Well, good evening and welcome to the Institute on the Constitution's first Friday lecture series. I'm Rob McQuay. I'm your host for the evening. Um, I'm also the production manager for uh, the Institute. So again, all of the audiovisual uh, products that you see or get, um, I'm responsible for. So uh, hopefully you enjoy them and uh, if uh, you don't, you can uh, leave a comment or maybe not. <laughs> uh, well, for tonight and um, for next month as well, during the summer here, we're doing uh, what we call replays. So we're replaying um, some previous First Friday lectures. And uh, tonight uh, we, have, uh, we have a good one. We, we're selecting lectures that we hope are timely and are important for what is going on today. Um, and I think, um, well, this, this one tonight is timely whenever. Um, this is an older um, video, but you'll see that things that were relevant and important then are entirely relevant and important uh, now. So tonight we're going to replay a lecture given by co-founder Michael Perutka. It's called Interposition, and uh, in this lecture, Michael uh, describes an important but seldom used act that protects citizens from tyranny at all levels of civil government. And so we'll get to that in just a minute. We've got a couple of announcements that I wanna go through um, quickly and uh, get you right to uh, the video for tonight. Uh, first of all, well, we've got a 4th of July sale starting um, tonight, July 1st, tonight, 20% off uh, of every, anything that, uh, that you can see except for the legacy library products. So when you go to the store at theamericanview.com, uh, you, you'll want to look at uh, everything that is not legacy library products and you get 20% off. Use the code 1776. That's it code 1776 when you go to check out uh, that sale will end at midnight Monday night July 4th so that's 20% off until all the way through midnight Monday night or Tuesday morning I guess I should say okay our member drive uh, is starting it's now through September 17th which is Constitution Day uh, we will also have our September first Friday um, on that day, the 17th. Will not be the first Friday of the month, so just that's just a heads up on that. It'll be on Constitution Day, September 17th. But the member drive is from now until then, and new members will get an American View bookmark. So please join us. Consider joining us. It's ten dollars a month. Um, become a member today. Okay, the grand prize for our third annual membership drawing will be announced on the 4th via email. So sign up uh, for our newsletter at the bottom of the website as well. That's the AmericanView.com. Uh, or you can find it at Institute on the Constitution.com. Either way, we have in depth instructor um, uh, training by Ricky Pepin and um, you can find that on the uh, the website how to uh, how to start a class near you and uh, find that on the website. Also, our uh, instructor uh, starter kits are in stock and still on sale on our website. You got everything there that you need to start teaching a class. It's all in one kit, and uh, you can find that also. Uh, in the store uh, on the uh, on the website instructor host material so look for that uh, and then also uh, you can become a member again we, we we mentioned it become a member take our courses online we also have instructor manuals available um, you'll find that um, in the uh, there's a member login and that'll help you to uh, join become a member Okay, so um, without any further ado, let's um, let's get to the video. Tonight, IOTC presents Inner Position, 
what our state and local officials must do to stem the tide of federal lawlessness which is destroying our country. It is my great and distinct pleasure to introduce my colleague, my mentor, and my very dear friend, Michael Anthony Peruca. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's not fair. It's very much appreciated. God bless you, Susan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, there is a God. Amen. And our rights do come from Him. Hallelujah. And the purpose of civil government is to protect and secure these God-given rights. If you have a pen, I know you, we, we gave you our outline today. That outline that you have in your hands, by the way, uh, it was kind of a last-minute decision by me. It's my notes that I made for the le this lecture tonight, and I thought, why not share it with you? So that, those pages that start Institute on the Constitution right there are nothing more than my notes that I'm going to be using tonight. So you're going to get a feel about how I spell, <laughs> how I organize, or how I can't spell, perhaps. But um, that's really what you have in front of you. Um, there is a God. And our rights do come from him. And the purpose of civil government is to protect and defend those God-given rights. If you have a pen along with those pieces of paper, you might actually underline that or write that down. We're going to come back to that. And it's very, very important. There is a God. Our rights come from him. The purpose of civil government is to protect and secure God-given rights. The reason I repeated that a couple times is not because I made it up. I happen to agree with it. But it comes from the most historic and probably the, the, the most perfectly articulated document of interposition that exists in the world, and that's the Declaration of Independence of these United States of America. And that's the principle that was laid forth in the first paragraph. That's the understanding of American law and government. There are other understandings of law and government where the purpose of government is to redistribute wealth, where the purpose of government is to make sure they control all the people, the purpose of government is to make sure your seatbelt is buckled, <laughs> or make sure you're wearing your helmet. There are other, or to make sure that, that we, have, that we uh, take what from A and give to B. But that's not the American understanding of law and government. The American understanding of law and government, as expressed in the Declaration, is what class? There is a God. Our rights come from him. And the purpose of civil government is to protect and secure these God-given rights. The purpose of the presentation tonight is to begin the discussion of interposition. It's to introduce this discussion of interposition. It's certainly not to exhaust the discussion of interposition. As a matter of fact, as I was preparing this, I started thinking we need to we probably should have a whole lesson, a whole, a whole series of lessons, a whole program, a class, a course on interposition. How many people ever heard of interposition, say, before the last month? How many have ever heard? Not many people. How many people have ever heard of interposition uh, before tonight? Not, not, not many. It's a relatively new concept for you, I, I would imagine. But yet, I just told you that the document that lays forth the foundational principles of American law and government is found it is, is an articulation of the doctrine of interposition. And so somebody knew about it sometime, somewhere, right? Even though we might not, we might have been kind of dumbed down to not understand it or not recognize it, but it does exist in our history, doesn't it? Because the men who, were, who in 1776 wrote that document and wrote the Constitution, which is also a document of interposition, um, that contains the doctrine of interposition. Those men who grew up in the 1730s and 1740s and 1750s, they understood this, but we don't. So the purpose of tonight's lecture and tonight's uh, presentation is to reintroduce, to re-begin the discussion of interposition. This is not something that is new. This is something that is old. This is not something that is revolutionary. This is something that is restorative. We're going, just like our founding fathers wouldn't have said that the American Revolution was a revolution, they wouldn't have called it that. We, the textbooks sometimes now call it the American Revolution, they would have called it the American War for Independence. They would have called it a restoration of their ancient rights. Okay, so what we're doing is not revolutionary, but restorative. It's not new, it's old. Let me pause right here in my notes, because I don't want to... I don't want you to think that I think this is a light subject. This is a very, very important subject. These are very important things we're going to discuss. But this week, I saw something on the internet, and some of you I know saw it because you, because you, uh, you, uh, you laughed when you saw this on the screen. How many people have seen what we're going to see? How many people are familiar with this? Okay, not many of you. Good. This is lighthearted, 
Um, but it's to set the stage for something that we're going to talk about. Okay, this is a little bit lighthearted. I don't want you to think that I think this is a joke. But this guy, Tim Hawkins, is a brilliant fabulous. Hey, everybody. Gather around. I'm here to give you anything you like. You want free college, energy, mortgages, <laughs> whatever you like. You have come to the right place. Why? I'll tell you why. Who can take your money? Who can take your money? With a twinkle in their eye. A twinkle in their eye. Take it all away and give it to some other guy. The government. The government. The government can. The government can. And who can tax the sunrise? Who can tax the sunrise? Who can tax the trees? Who can tax the trees? And let your own. And who can give a bailout? Who can give a bailout? Tell us to behave. Tell us to behave. And make the founding fathers roll over in the grave. The government. The government. Oh, the government can. The government can. And the government can. Cause they mix it up. Well, as I make it all taste good. Make it all taste good. The government. Soon we'll have to eat our dishes. Mm, delicious. Oh, who can, who can be a failure? In so many ways. In so many ways. And instead of getting fired, hey, we'll give ourselves a raise. The government. That's what, so you could just pull it up. It's on the internet. Tim Hawkins. Just put up Tim, Tim Hawkins. It's called The Government Can. I show you that. And, and again, it's lighthearted, but it's, it, we're, we're to the point now almost, I think, in our culture where the government is just made, it's just foolish. These are foolish things that are happening. They're beyond, they're, 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 they're beyond evil. They're beyond out of control. They're beyond unconstitutional. They're beyond immoral. And, they're, and, they're, and the foolishness of it is coming home to roost. And, 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 and the government is being held in, in lower and lower esteem because of the foolish things that, that they're doing. So, I, I, again, it's called The Government Can. If you, if you Google Tim Hawkins, you, can, uh, you see that he has some other funny stuff, too. Um, but before we even define interposition, back to interposition, uh, because we need to interpose to, to, to change these things. Before we define it, let me just give, let's just do a, a, a little illustration of interposition. So, because it's not a, a doctrine and understanding that we have uh, very well. Can I ask, ma'am, would you mind stepping forward and just say, Dude, would you mind doing that for me? You look shy, but <laughs> I'm going to pick on you for a second. Would you just would you stand right over here for a second? Okay, uh, this, is, this is your daughter, okay? I'm going to pick somebody in a second. This is your daughter? Yes. Okay, good. You're going to be the father. Would you stand up here, please? <laughs> would you stand up here? Okay. Um, and uh, ma'am, can I ask you to just stand up for just one second here? Okay. Now, because you're something, you're, you're right, you're fine right there. Would you stand right here for just one second? Just a, just a simple illustration, okay? Now, because you're away on business sometime, because you care about your daughter and you want to take care of her safety and her welfare, you went and got a watchdog. Okay? You got a watchdog for your yard, okay? You're the watchdog. <laughs> Thanks for role playing this. I appreciate this. I'll make this up to you, okay? Okay. Now, the watchdog, you got, and, and by the way, you got a pit bull. Okay? You got a pit bull. Do, 
You could be a pit bull. Yeah, you? you could be a pit bull. I bet she can. Could she be a pit bull? I bet no. she could. <laughs> um, that was an unfair question. That was a smart, smart alecky smart question. That was a smart alecky smart question. Um, good, good answer. He answered correctly, by the way. Um, okay, so you, you want to protect your daughter and her friends and your wife and your family and your loved ones. So you get this pit bull for, the, for your yard, okay? And everything goes fine except the pit bull. Um, and you got a pit bull because it is strong, and it is, and it, and it can do the job. But pit bulls are disposed to do something else, aren't they? I know we have some dog lovers in the crowd here, so I don't want to offend anybody who's a dog lover. But pit bulls are disposed to do something, aren't they? What happens sometimes with pit bulls? Sometimes they turn on and can attack their owner, okay? So now, okay, if I, let me just ask you to stand right there, sir. Okay, now, the pit bull has decided to turn, as pit bulls sometimes do, and has started to attack the child. Matter of fact, it's already attacked the child for, well, maybe 60 or 70 years. We'll leave that out. It's already attacked the child uh, once or twice, and it's already, the child's already bleeding. It's, uh, the, the child's arm is uh, damaged, and... and uh, and its flesh is torn, and the pit bull has already done that. Now, the pit bull is after the dog again. Right now, the pit bull is moving toward the dog. Sir, what do you do? What did he just do? He just interposed. Thank you. You can sit down. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Very simply, he interposed. He put himself between the attack dog and the intended victim. Okay? But first, the attack dog was the watchdog, wasn't it? Its purpose changed. And so, there had to be a change in the, owner's, uh, in the owner's behavior as well. Okay, let me ask just a couple of questions about that. The, uh, we already talked about the purpose of the watchdog. The original purpose was to act as a guardian. But was the watchdog ever actually the authority in the yard? Was the watchdog ever in charge? Who was in charge? The person that bought the, yeah, the owner of the watchdog, the father the person who bought the watchdog for, the, for that purpose, okay? So the source of authority was the father. Was the watchdog the lawgiver? No. Once you have a watchdog and you, put it in, and you put it in your yard, does the watchdog become the boss just because you put it there? No. no, the watchdog is there for a purpose. When it belies its purpose or the purpose changes, then you need to, what? Interpose, Interpose. right. So that's just a simple illustration of what is to be done. When the purpose and the intention of the dog changes, there has to be an interposition, a standing between. Okay, now we're ready to look at um, the, the definition of Webster's. In, in Webster's 1828 dictionary, interposition is defined like this. A being placing or coming in between, an intervention, as the interposition of the Baltic Sea between Germany and Sweden. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. Um, the interposition of the moon between the earth and the sun uh, occasions a solar eclipse. Okay, when the moon gets, the moon is getting between the sun and the earth, and that's what an e eclipse is, right? Uh, number two, intervenient agency as the interposition of the magistrate in quieting sedition. How many evidences we have of divine interposition in favor of good men? We'll talk about divine interposition in just a second. Number three, mediation, agency between parties. So this. This is a, a horizontal form of interposition. If we, if we interpose between two people who are arguing, okay? And there's vertical and horizontal. And number four, anything interposed. Now, interestingly, the Random House Dictionary, we're fast forwarding, that was 1828. Okay, the Random House Dictionary in 1966 said this. Number one, the act or fact of interposing or the condition of being interposed. Don't you love dictionary language? <laughs> yeah, that really number two, something interposed. Interposition is something interposed. Okay, but the reason I'm showing you this definition is for the third one. The U.S. doctrine that an individual state may oppose any federal action it believes encroaches on its sovereignty. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. In 1966, this was the definition in the Random House Dictionary of interposition. And that's actually the only really, the other ones are kind of dictionary uh, definitions. This is interesting because it's not a term or idea that's popular in today's culture, but in the 1750s, as we said before, everybody knew it. And as recently as 19, what did I say, 1966, um, it, was, it was part of the Random House Dictionary. Now, we're going to pull up Black's Law Dictionary here, Black's Law, fourth edition. And what is it? I don't have it in my notes. The doctrine that a state, in the exercise of its sovereignty, may reject a mandate of the federal government deemed to be unconstitutional 
or to exceed the powers delegated to the federal government. Wow! This concept is based on, based on the Tenth Amendment, reserving to the states the powers not delegated to the United States. We're going to talk about this a little more in a, in a minute, but remember about the Tenth Amendment for just one second. The Tenth Amendment basically says, and it's, it's listed right here on this panel, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited to it by it to the states are reserved to the, to the states respectively or to the people. What that's saying is we list the powers of the federal government in the Constitution, and if it's not there, if we didn't list it, they don't have it. So we're gonna, uh, I'm going to re reiterate this when I get into this part of the, of the dialogue here, but the, the Constitution is a, is, a, is, a, uh, is a document of omission. It lists the things that, that, that for the, the powers that it gives the federal government. If it's not listed, it's not there. So to say that, well, the federal government can do something because it's not prohibited by the Constitution is a backward statement, is it not? The way to look at it is, if it's not listed there, they can't do it. And Article 1, Section 8 lists 18 things that the federal government has the authority to tax and spend your money for, that Congress has the authority to tax and spend your money for. And many things that they currently do, like health care or education, et cetera, are not there. Okay. So let's, for a minute, talk about the theological understanding of interposition, because we should set the background. If it's not in heaven, it can't be on earth. We have to understand it. We have to understand it theologically and then see its model uh, on earth, okay? In his, uh, in his 1758 hymn, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. Da, 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 da. Remember this one? Robert Robinson's hymn in the third stanza says this, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, I shouldn't be singing it, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Okay, here we have the ultimate vertical example of interposition. We are, God is perfect, God is sovereign, Matthew 5, 28, be, be perfect, therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. 1 Peter 1, 16, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Okay, so God is holy and perfect and just, and he will not compromise his law for anyone. Although mo in modern theology, we kind of want him to do that, don't we? Yes. We kind of want well, I'm just going to keep doing this until God changes around and sees it my way. <laughs> right? That's kind, of, that's, that's kind of a modern, heretical view of, of, uh, of theology. But God is sovereign and perfect, and he's not going to compromise his law for anyone. And we, so perfection is required in order to gain fellowship with God, and we're not perfect. Man is sinful, Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. James uh, 2, uh, in the 10th uh, verse, uh, in the 10th chapter, excuse, uh, excuse me, James chapter 2, verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So one sin is all sin, okay? So here we have this problem theologically, that God is perfect and we are not. So how do we have fellowship with him? We have fellowship with him because Christ shed his precious blood and interposed for us. God in between, just like the father did for, between the dog and the child, okay? Jesus Christ, uh, by his death, was that perfect sacrifice, sacrifice, excuse me, that interposed before a perfect creator on our behalf. Christ's sacrifice on behalf of sinful man is the perfect and ultimate example of interposition. It's also a classic example of vertical interposition. And we've also talked about and will talk more about horizontal interposition. So now, are you with me so far? Are we doing okay? Now that we have a basic understanding of the definition of the word and the ultimate perfect example of interposition, let's try to get a fix on the doctrine of interposition as it applies to law and government. In order to see the framework for this discussion, I've got to kind of back up to, um, to this lecture that we gave last year, Up Against the Wall. Pastor Whitney talked about this. Uh, we gave this lecture, and uh, we have them for sale back here. Um, whatever they are, they're a deal. Except, you know, I want to tell you what. I'm not a vain person, he said. But this has to be the worst picture I've ever taken of me that's on the front of this, this thing. This is, this is embarrassing. You should buy this just to see how bad this picture is of me. <laughs> This, this is, uh, I can't show you, it's too, somebody, somebody hopefully should get fired for putting my picture like that on, I don't, but I'm not vain, I'm not vain. 
Um, but look, what we talked about in that lecture is briefly this. I'm going to take about, I'm going to hope this only takes about five or six minutes to basically give you this concept, because we need to talk about this to then talk about interposition. Now, we're going to talk about the biblical jurisdictions here, and that's what the Up Against the Wall lecture was about. And please, if you want to get this broader and deeper, get this tape so you, so you, can, uh, so you can do that. God has ordained, I'm going to walk out with you here, God has ordained four jurisdictions. Jurisdiction, the word means to speak the law. There's four areas where God has given authority and jurisdiction uh, over, over his law. Now, one of them, and we, we've represented them on the four walls of this room. You see four signs that look alike, okay? Let me talk about the one on this wall. The self, we have it put over there because of the stage here, but the, there's the jurisdiction of self. God has ordained self-government, okay? He holds us accountable for our actions. That's what the Ten Commandments is, is, speaks to. The first table of the law, the things, the duties you owe to God. The second table of the law, the duties you owe to man, okay? So we, we, ha we, ha we are supposed to be self-governed, and we will be accountable to God for that. So there's one individual jurisdiction, and then there's three institutional jurisdictions. Let me talk about this one first. There's the jurisdiction of the family. Okay, the family actually is the ultimate welfare agency, isn't it? Because, because the family trains up young men and women, children, in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And uh, if you had a symbol of the family, one of the symbols you could have of the family government is, this is, good, this is supposed to represent the rod of discipline. Okay? The in the family, we discipline and we teach and we train up children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And we care for them. When children are born, they're ultimately on welfare. I mean, they're, they're completely on welfare, aren't they? And the idea is that they won't be on welfare uh, as, as, th as they're trained up. Uh, they'll, they'll learn to be independent. And they'll learn to be uh, self-governing. Right? Uh, and they'll learn to be members of the civil government and the church government. They'll, be, they'll, they'll learn their, their respective roles. But the family is, the, is, the, is, 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 a, is a biblical jurisdiction. Health. Welfare. Education, all are on that wall, okay? Let's think of the jurisdiction of the family as the corners of this wall. Let's just, for, just make like these walls are all perfectly rectangular and they, have, and they have perfect boundaries. The jurisdiction of the family is on that wall. As a matter of fact, if you hold that over there, uh, take, take that. He's got, okay, he's, got the, he's got the rod of discipline. He's got the, the jurisdiction of the family. Let me talk about the jurisdiction of the church for a minute. If we had, if we had a, a shepherd's nook here or shepherd's hook, Really, that would, be the, that would be the symbol of the church. The church is a redemptive order. It, do, it, it, can, it can coerce only by suasion, moral suasion. The church speaks the word of God. Okay? God has given that, that, uh, that function. It, it, it administers the sacraments. Okay? It has certain duties that it performs. It has the shepherd's hook, which guides, but can't coerce, or can't coerce with force. Okay? So certain things are the sacraments, administering of the sacraments, the preaching of the word of God. That's in the church jurisdiction. So we talked about the self. We talked about the, the family jurisdiction. We talked about the church jurisdiction. Now the back wall is the state. It says civil. It's the civil government. Okay? The civil government has a jurisdiction. And basically the civil government has an internal and an external function. Just two functions. The internal function is to administer justice. Matter of fact, I think I have... Oh, he's got it up there. Okay. I was going to say, I have these little, uh, these are too small for you all to see, but I was going to say here, the, 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 the civil government administers justice internally and externally. It protects the borders. Okay? It protects the sovereignty of the country. It's got those two functions. It doesn't have the function of health care. It doesn't have the function of welfare. God didn't give it. Now, th this is explained in the biblical ba basis and background. It's explained more in that lecture, okay? I'm just trying to give this, this, uh, this outline uh, and this illustration. So these two, let me just ask you back here. Hold those back here, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to hold them up when I want. I'll point at you when I, when I need to, okay? Um, okay, so the civil government has those. And because the civil government has those, those responsibilities, it has the power of the sword. It has the sword. Rod of discipline, shepherd's hook, the sword. It needs to have the sword. Now, 
Giving any jurisdiction the power of the sword is a dangerous thing. You know who said so? Oh, here's the sword. I'm going to hold this here for the time being because I don't trust you all yet. But that's, but that, that, and that's actually an important point, okay? Let me put these down here. These other things say welfare. Here, these are, here's welfare, education, health, and uh, hold them over there, will you? Don, give them to Don. Don, hold on to those for a minute. Okay. Now, the civil government has the sword. Now, while we're here, let me just pause for a second. It's important to have, to have these jurisdictions understood that when... When one jurisdiction jumps off its wall and starts to do the job of another jurisdiction, that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. God said not to do that, and it never works out well. Matter of fact, it could get you trillions and trillions of dollars in debt. Yeah. <laughs> that could happen if you start taking on jobs that aren't your job. Now, in this example, I just said God ordained all these jurisdictions. If Just for a minute, if you picture those walls as, the juris as, as those jurisdictions he ordained, let's just picture... I'm not going to hang this up here, but just picture God is on the ceiling. Of course, he's beyond the ceiling, and he's, and he's, 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 uh, he's everlasting, eternal, and omniscient. But let's just think of his jurisdiction covering all of these. He comes down through every wall. He's in charge of the church. He's in charge of the self. He's in charge of the civil government. He's in charge of the family. His law governs all of these, okay? Now, there is a proper understanding... So, so think of this, think of, think of this up there, okay? Think of God as coming, and his, his jurisdiction coming down through every wall. But he separated these jurisdictions for our purposes, okay? Now, let me ask you this. Please point, if you will, to the place where there's a separation between the jurisdiction of church and the jurisdiction of state. Point to it. Where is it physically in this room? Thank you. Thank you. It's right over here where Steve Krukar is standing. Isn't it? It's right over here. Here's the jurisdiction of the church. Here's the jurisdiction of the state. If this wall came to a corner right here, just imagine that it does, that corner would be the place where there's a separation of church and state. You don't want Bill Clinton administering the sacraments. Do you? No, absolutely. you? Nor anybody in his family, right? You also don't want the church going to war in Afghanistan or anywhere else, do you? Because the church, you don't, you don't, you don't mix these functions. There is a proper understanding. There's a redemptive order and there's a civil order. They have the sword. They have the shepherd's hook, okay? There is a separation. So, like all great lies, like all great lies, what do all great lies have? Who said that? They have an element of truth. They have a little bit of truth. So the, the big lie of separation of church and state is that there is a truth. I just showed you the truth of separation of church and state. They have separate functions and they shouldn't be mixed. But the lie of separation of church and state is they want to make you believe that this is the separation of church and state. That you can't talk about God in the civil government. And there's no separation here. His jurisdiction comes down every wall. You with me? Yes. You have that illustration. Is that helpful? Okay. There is a separation, but it's not here. It's not here. God is the God of civil government. There is no law that can be suffered to be, a law, be called a law unless it complies and is harmonious with God's law. That's why when you say, well, we can't, we can't pray... At the beginning of, of uh, our House of Delegates meetings, we can't pray at the beginning of, of, our, uh, of our state legislature, the opening of our state legislature. Why in heaven's name not? There's no separation here. There's no separation between God and government, or God and the family, or God and church, or God and self. As a matter of fact, the very first presupposition of American law and government is that there is a God, our rights come from Him. And the purpose of civil government is to protect and defend God-given rights. How could that make any sense? That would be a nonsensical statement. It would be a nonsensical first premise of American law and government if, in fact, you cut off God 
from the discussion. If you, cut, if you, if you say the, li the, the line is there. Are you with me? Yes. Do you see that? Okay. Thank you for your patience. We needed to make that point so that we can make this one. Um, I've, I've discussed about the power flow of the United States Constitution. It's a document of omission. The Tenth Amendment says anything that's not listed there, they don't have that power. So wherever we're, whenever we look for, for government action, we're looking to see if it fits two, two parameters, okay? We're always looking to know if government actions are one, biblical. Is it on that wall? Okay, did God say that go the government should do it? And number two, we're looking to see, is it part of the contract? Is it one of the 18 things we've given government to do? You with me? So we're, we're looking on that wall. Anytime that, that there's a proposal for the government to take some action, the civil government to take some action, it's got to fill one of the, both of those two bills. It's got to be either for administering of justice or protecting the borders. And it's got to be one of the things we said it can do in the Constitution, right? So those are the limits of the authority. And importantly, when I talked before about, about the civil government having the sword, given any institution the power of the sword is a, is a solemn thing to do, isn't it? George Washington said, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. It is, and he also went on to say at another time, it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God in the Bible. And by the way, another time, I don't think we have this up here, but he also, oh, there, there it is, it is there. He said firearms are second only to the Constitution in, is in importance. They are the people's liberty teeth. Because if you have rights, you need to have a way to defend them, don't you? Ultimately, you need to have a way to defend them or they're meaningless. Okay? So the reason we have a Second Amendment is not so that we can make sure we can go hunting when we feel like it. It's so that we can stop. It's so that we can interpose if we need to. Right? Because you need a way, in this example we used at the beginning, you need a way to protect your daughter in the event that the dog turns. Don't you? Okay. Now. I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask for a couple of volunteers here. Can I ask you, young man, if you'll if you'll stand right in front of the podium here for me, please? And then, um, Stan, can I ask you to come right here and stand here? And then, um, B, can I ask you to come out here? Right here, and then Matthew. Yes. Would you Would you come right here for a second here? I mean, four of you right here. Just stand in the line for me here, okay? Now, just okay. Let me let me talk about Stan for a second here. Stan, okay. You, young man, Samuel. You're going to have an easy job here because you're, you're just the average citizen. You're, you're like, you're the kid in the yard, okay? You're just, you're the citizen we're protecting, all right? Now, you're the first line of defense, Stan. You are the local, the lower magistrate. You are, let's say, let's call you the sheriff. You're local government, okay? Now, your job, and you have the power of the sword because you're civil government. There's your sword. I want you to turn and face this way, and I want you to defend him, okay? Here's the citizen. Here's the, here's the innocent. Here's the person trying to live peaceably so he can love and serve the Lord. Okay? Living in, in peace and justice. Okay? So here is his protector. B, she's a state official. She's a delegate. She's a state senator. She's a governor. Okay? She represents, she represents the state government. Okay? She's doing the same thing. She's got to so hold that. Hold that like you mean it. There you go. Okay. She, that's it. She's doing the same thing, but in a, big, in a broader jurisdiction. And actually, you could think of her, think of, think of her like if we had a little, uh, if, if she could just separate into three people and be, there'd be three Bs right here. Because she's three branches of state government. She's the legislative and the executive and the judicial. And, and, and if one of them gets out of line with each other, there's horizontal interposition, right? But this is all examples of interposition. He's interposing to make sure that he's safe, we're, that we're all safe, okay? She's doing it at a little broader level. Okay. Now, this is Bush, Obama, Harry Reid, Congress, <laughs> the Supreme Court, and everything else. That's who Matthew is here. Hold up your sword. Yeah, get, get serious with that. Yeah. All right. All right. Now, here, here's, here's, he's protecting the borders. Now, they're all supposed to be administering justice, protecting the borders, so he can live peacefully. Okay? Now, What happens in civil government? What happens with pit bulls because we're fallen creatures? Because man is a sinful creature. Lord Acton said that
power corrupts and, and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely, didn't he? That's what happens. That's the natural order of things. It's, that's the, it, we live in a fallen world since Adam. That's what occurs, okay? Now, what happens when he, because he gets power hungry and drunk with it, turns around and now, instead of using his shield to protect and defend the borders this way, he is oppressing the people. Okay? Now, B, what are you going to do? you got a couple of cho choices. Okay? Are you going to stand here because you took an oath to protect and defend the people? Are you going to stand here and interpose on the people's behalf? Or are you going to go, oh, I don't know, the Environmental Protection Agency says we've got to put these regulations on our businesses, so here I go. Okay? And then sheriff, county council, county executive, stand, okay? Now, when those two turn around and they're going to oppress the people and eat out their substance in a long train of usurpations and abuses, what are you going to do? You took an oath to protect and defend Samuel, didn't you? Yes. But it's hard, isn't it? Yes. This isn't easy, is it? You took an oath to protect and defend Samuel. But the Environmental Protection Agency, which isn't even a, which isn't even a it's a member of the executive branch, it's not even congressional, can't even make law, has, has, has put this burden on her. She's turned around and put it on you. So why don't you just slash and crash him, okay? Okay? Because that's an easy thing to do, isn't it? Please, please see this picture, folks, because this is the anarchy, the injustice, the usurpation that, it, that is occurring unless... Please turn back around, folks. I appreciate that. I like you facing that way better. Um, <laughs> stay here. I, I still need you for a minute. Okay. Now, there could be a time... Let me just do this. Let, let me just give this example. There could be a time, for example, when, let's say, B in state government, she turns around and says... We're going to limit and restrict firearms in, in the state, okay? Now, and we're going we're to put, we, we don't care what the Second Amendment says. Um, Stan says, wait a minute, I'm the sheriff, and I know what the Constitution says, and I took an oath to protect and defend it, but you know, this is hard. This is hard. So, so Stan's got a decision to make, okay? He might stand there, but this is interesting because this is one place where I think there's an example where the federal government, because the Second Amendment is such a broad language, it says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And it's, and, it's, and it's a federal amendment to the federal constitution. This is where I think he should actually come back around, over on the other side of B, and he should say, wait a minute, you can't do that to these people. Because this is something that I, that, that I have a, a duty to protect and defend. Okay, go back up to where you were. Okay, so we have situations where this could be the oppressor, this could be the oppressor, all three could be the oppressor. What we need, what we need is someone recognizing their duty to their oath of office and their duty to the Constitution and their duty before God because he's still here. This is part of the deal. That's why I had to show you there's no separation of church and state that says he can do whatever he wants. No, we're still subject here. So, in, th in this example, this tension, it could be him, it could be her, it could be him. Any of them could be the one that's turning to face and causing, the, the, causing the, the, the tyranny. Any one of them could be tyrants. And this, and this tension is built into our constitutional system. So that somebody should protect and defend. Okay? All right, now, while you're still there, one more, one more, I've got to say a couple more things and I'll let you go. Now, uh, you're just, you're just, you doing all right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, now, I want you to, to, to see a couple of things here that are important. See how important the acknowledgement of God is in this equation. Because if he turns around and starts oppressing the people, okay? If the, if the central government, the federal government turns around and starts oppressing the people, and her understanding is, well, he's the lawgiver. She's got to turn around. There's nothing else to do. There's no sense in doing anything else. She's got to turn around. The only thing that keeps her here is, wait a minute, he's not the law. The law comes from God, and, it comes and, and, and we have to look to see whether he has this power from God, and secondly, whether it's in the Constitution. So she's got she's to know that. She's got to understand in her position, 
She's got to understand the Constitution. She's got to understand all these things. And she's got to understand that she is going to answer to God if she doesn't do that. You with me? And so, do, and so does he. Okay, you can turn back around for a second. Now, let me also sh say how important it is to recognize that we're not a democracy. Because what if he turns around and starts to eat out the substance of the people and he says, you will turn around and, do, and, and, oppress, and oppress Samuel because 51% of the people said anybody with the first name starting with S, we can oppress. 51% of the people said that, at least today. And then tomorrow, 51% of the people said, no, we can't do that. Then the day after, 52% of the people said that we can do that again. Okay, you see how democracy doesn't work here? You see how that's not, that's not the system that works? We have to have the allegiance to the higher moral law like we do in a republic. Okay. Now, you see how important it is for this guy, the local law enforcement, okay? See how important it is for him to be local? What if he's a Hessian from Germany? What's he, what if he's from China? What if he's from Germany? What's he, what is he, if he's from the United Nations somewhere? What if he's the military? What if he's the police? See how important it is to not have, to have local police and, and, and law enforcement be local people? Because this is his grandma. Pardon me, Samuel. This is, <laughs> this is his kid. This is his mom. This is his grandma. This is his neighborhood. Okay? But it's not his neighborhood if he's from China. Right? Okay, can you also see how important it is that in this local sphere that juries be made up of local people? Because this is his neighborhood. This is his grandma. This is the, this, this is the grandma of the guy he went to school with, or he grew up with. Okay? That's why that's important. So local juries are very important. Okay? And, excuse me for not having this memorized. All right, the last thing here, but, and I'm going to let you sit down, is see how it is in the, the importance that the people be a moral people. John Adams said this Constitution is intended for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate for the governance of any others. If these people don't understand these duties, then this can't work. They won't interpose. They'll turn around and everybody will be beaten up on Samuel. And I don't want that to happen because I've beat up on Samuel enough in this example. Okay, everybody can sit down. You got that? Thank you all very much for that. Okay, so we get to this question then. And I hope I'm doing all right on time. I when is interposition lawful and appropriate? When is it right for these folks to interpose? When it's for, is it right for us to interpose? There have been a number of historic reformers who have, who have uh, advocated and articulated the principles of interposition. Augustine in the City of God, Aquinas in Summa Theologica, Calvin in his Institutes, Junius Brutus, not his real name, in Vin Vindicae Contra Tyrannus, uh, Samuel Rutherford in Lex Rex, John Knox, was, who was a 16th century father of Presbyterian Church in Scotland. We passed out, and you have in your notes there, a, uh, a sheet that, that gives you further reading on this subject. Please take advantage of that. I can't cover all of that now, uh, obviously, but this, this is a whole course in understanding when interposition is appropriate. For right now, let me just talk about Aquinas. He said these four things, and these are in your notes. Believers are to honor and obey the civil magistrate. We're supposed to do that. And when civil authority compels us to disobey God directly, we can't do that. We have to resist, even if we have to be martyred. We can't directly take an order and commit a sin, because civil government says so. Okay, but short of that, we are, uh, if, if, if there's not an excess of tyranny, we're supposed to tolerate it for a reasonable time. Okay? We don't just go postal because some, some civil magistrate offended us, okay? This is not the way it works. This is not biblical interposition, okay? If we are justified in resistance, however, and this is an important point that, you, that, you got, that you've got to remember, and I hope, and I hope that the, the folks here who are in civil government uh, will remember this. Here's what Aquinas said. He said, it seems that to proceed against the cruelty of tyrants is an action to be undertaken not by the private presumption of a few, but rather by public authority. If we're going to interpose, if we want interposition to happen, we got to come to stand. We got to come to be. We've got to do it through this lawful authority. We're not a rabble. We're not a crowd. We're not a mob. That's not the way to do it. We're going to do it in an organized and logical fashion. And we're going to put up and we're going to suffer under tyranny for a reasonable period of time until our heart is right. And we're not doing it because we've been offended and personally insulted. We're doing it because we want this order to be set straight, and we see it, it, it's, it's God's order, and that's, and that's what we're supposed to do. 
Okay, aided by the writings of these, of, of, of these, um, of our founders derived from scriptures, here's the essential steps. Let me kind of go through this. Of, of biblical lawful interposition. Number one, we take the offense. We embrace the personal insults in the, industry, in the injury, and we respond in love. And, and for background of that, you have, you have Christ saying in Matthew, you've heard it said that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, give him your cloak as well. And if someone forces you to go one mile, go two miles with him. Okay? So this is not, civil resistance and civil disobedience is not the first resort. It's the last resort. We're not rabble-rousers. We're not easily taking insult. All right, Dr. Jaley said something, and, and um, uh, Dr. Jaley's, uh, Dr. Paul Jaley from the Plymouth Rock Foundation, I want to recommend for broader and deeper understanding of these matters, please go to, um, he, he has a, a, a series of four CDs called Interposition, Lawful Resistance to Unjust Government. This is excellent, okay? He makes a statement in here, and we have about nine or ten of them in the back, I think, um, and, and I think we, we had to pay $30 a piece for them, and I think that's what we're charging. These are, this, is, this is well worth it. I know that sounds like a lot of money, but those are, these are well worth that. Jaley says this. He said, we sh as believers, as Christians, we should be more devoted to submission to God's word than we are devoted to standing against something that's wrong. That doesn't mean we shouldn't stand against things that are wrong, but we should be more devoted to, standing, to being in submission to God's word than we are mad and want to do something about something that's wrong. Okay? Okay, number two, we talked about the fact that we're going to take the insult first. Number two, we're going to make a personal appeal for a redress of grievances. That's part of biblical interposition. If your brother sins against you, you go and show him his fault. We don't just get mad and go grab our Glock. Okay, that's not the way this works. Okay, we try other means of resistance. We boycott if that's appropriate. We shake the dust off your feet at the gate. Matthew 10, 14 says, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. Okay, we're going to try to live peaceably even in the face of tyranny. We're not going to just go try to assassinate somebody or shoot the tyrant. Okay, we're not going to upset the social order just because on, on light or transient causes. Number four, civil interposition. We're going to do it, when we do this, lawful resistance through already established channels. We're going to go through our civil government. We're going to talk to Don Dwyer. We're going to employ... Senator Alex Mooney. We're going to employ Bobby Franklin. We want to go through lawful channels to appeal for redress of our grievances. Okay? Um, not as rebels who have, been, who have been personally insulted, but as freemen defending God's order of things. We're going to flee and be submissive and, and um, we're going to flee or, or be submissive in disobedience when commanded to disobey God. And, uh, of course, in Acts 5.29, Peter, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The pilgrims actually are an example of fleeing. They, they left and came to a new world to seek peace where they could worship freely and in peace. And then, finally, number six, we will resist by force using the sword, but only as a last resort. That's, that's not the first thing we do. Okay? Now, the last... Think of what I want to do here, the second to last thing I want to do with you tonight, is, is to just demonstrate for you the incredible historic example we have of interposition in the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence, many call uh, the ultimate um, and, and for the and, and the ultimate articulation, or as, you know, it, it's, it was done by men, so it's not perfect, uh, but it's a perfect example of, of, uh, civil inter of, of uh, biblical interposition. Okay, now the components are these five things. Number one, here's what you have to express if you're going to engage in, 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 in resistance. Number one, what are, the sorts of the, what are the source of the rights that are violated? Number two, under what authority are you interposing? Who are these lower magistrates that you're interposing with? Through. Number three, how have you demonstrated your submissive appeals for a, for a reasonable time period? Number four, to what specific abuses do you attribute your resistance and how are these unlawful? Okay, specific. Not just, I don't like the, the way things are going in Obamacare. Okay? We need to be specific. Number five, to what higher authority are you appealing? Now, let me just talk about those five things in the Declaration of Independence, and we'll wrap it up again. We'll take some questions. What are the sources of rights involved? Remember at the beginning of our lecture? There is a God. Our rights come from him. The purpose of civil government is to protect and secure God-given rights. 
Our founders said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They declare the source of authority, the source of the rights involved. The rights come from a creator God. Okay? And, and uh, just for a second, we, th that's backed up by uh, their understanding, uh, as, as, as articulated by Blackstone, the law of nature and nature's God is, is quoted in the first line of the Declaration of Independence. Where did they get that? They got that from Blackstone. Okay, Sir William Blackstone, Englishman, wrote uh, the commentaries on the laws of England. He said this about the laws of nature. Man, considered as a creature, must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator, for he is an entirely dependent being. It is necessary that he should in all points conform to his maker's will. This will of the maker is called the law of nature. Okay, and Paul talks about this knowledge of right and wrong being written on our hearts. The laws of God, nature's God in the Declaration of Independence, the doctrines, the doctrines that, th uh, that thus delivered we call the revealed or divine law, and they are to be found in the Holy Scriptures. And then Blackstone says this, upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation, depend all human laws. That is to say, no human law should be suffered to contradict these. Okay. Um, Blackstone would be, here's the, here's the revealed law, the Bible, here's the law of nature, and then, uh, and then any human law, what he called municipal law, if it's not in harmony with the first two, then it's not law. It might look like law, smell like law, then you might get put in jail for it, but it's not law. Okay? This is this, if you know the story of Roy Moore, this is what happened to Roy Moore. Okay? Um, okay, well, under what authority are you interposing? Who are the lower magistrates? In the Declaration? They said, we therefore the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled. Okay, these were elected representatives. This wasn't a mob. Number three, how have you demonstrated submissive appeals for a reasonable time period? And if you know the history of the Declaration, I won't go through the whole thing. If you know the history of the period, there were about 30 different oppressive acts that, that, that Parliament put on, the Tea Act, the Stamp Act, the Townsend Act, many, many different acts. Many times the, the colonies, uh, they tried to boycott, they sent appeals to the king. They sent appeals to parliament. They sent representatives. They, they humbly, graciously submitted to tyranny for a long time. Um, and they expressed that in a declaration like this. They said, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, total control, I can't read that, I'm sorry. Okay, I can't, okay. Um, well, along, well, it is their right and their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient suffering of these colonies and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former system of government. And they went on to say in every stage, this is still words from the Declaration, in every stage of these oppressions we have petitioned for redress in the most humblest terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant, okay, the dog is turned in the yard, right, is unfit to be the ruler of a free people, okay? And, and, and uh, it was true that they had petitioned graciously and humbly, and I, I won't read the Olive Branch petition to you, but that's one, one example of it. To what specific abuses do you attribute your resistance? Okay, well, there's five of them, we're on number four. To what specific abuses do you attribute your resistance? They, they say in the Declaration, the history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct ob object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. You know, like taking over the banks, taking over the insurance companies, yeah. taking over the car companies, and taking over, healthcare. Taking over healthcare. Okay. To, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world, they said. Okay, they're, they're, they're making this statement openly and they're saying let let the let the world be the jury for us here and the declaration then goes on to list 28 grievances against the king that fall into the following general areas and I and I and I listed them in this way um, and this isn't all of them but this these are general areas they had complaints about over regulation does that sound familiar <laughs> yeah. they had complaints about political manipulation mm -hmm. they complained to the king about executive supremacy they complained about the failure to protect the borders. They complained about the obstruction of the political process. They complained about judicial supremacy. They complained about bureaucratic government, 
specific grievances, okay? They complained about illegal uses of the military in the Declaration of Independence. They complained about him using foreign law over them. They complained about misuse of military tribunals. They complained about unconstitutional taxes. Does any of this sound familiar? They complained about jury injustice. They complained about, believe it or not, the advocation of world government. They complained about the loss of states' rights. Number five. So, so th that's really, that, what I just read, that's two-thirds of the Declaration of Independence, basically. Those paragraphs where they list the 27 or 28, it depends on how you count them, grievances against the king. Okay? To what higher authority did they appeal? They said this, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name of and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these United Col Colonies are and of a right ought to be free and independent states. And that and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, because remember, they were going up against the lar largest army and the largest navy in the history of man up to that point. They actually didn't have a chance. I love it when people ask me when I was running for president, say, why are you doing this, Mr. Perico? You don't have a chance. So I don't believe in chance. I believe in God's providence, and so did our founders. They said, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually uh, pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Now, in light of this American example of interposition, what do we want our lower magistrates to be? What do we want them to be? Well, we want them to know and demonstrate knowledge. And by the way, this is my list. You can add to this list, and I hope you will. We want them to know and demonstrate their knowledge of these jurisdictions and understand the limits of their authority and the limits of the authority of the higher magistrates. We want them to know when that magistrate has turned around and started to attack the people. We want them to know when the decision time is. They might not even realize that it's time to defend and protect the people. We want them to understand those things both biblically and constitutionally. Do they know the biblical jurisdictions? Do they know the Constitution? David will tell you when he ran for office and ran for the House of, uh, for the House of Delegates here, he was up against folks that had never read it. Somebody who was a sitting in, in the House of Delegates asked him, said, can I have a copy of that? It was the Constitution of the state of Maryland. He swore an oath to protect it and defend it. He never read it. Do they know the Constitution? Do they know where law comes from and what it is? Do they understand the American view and the purpose of government? There is a God of rights come from him. The purpose of government is to protect God-given rights. Do they know that? Or do they think that the, that the purpose of government is to redistribute wealth? Do they know that they are ministers of God? Think about this a minute. Romans 13. I think it's Romans 13, 4. For he is God's servant to you to do for, for your good. He is God's servant to do you good. Okay? How many of your people in the House of Delegates or your local police force or any of these people that took an oath that are your civil magistrates, how many of them do you think think that they are ministers of God. But in the American system of law and justice, they are. And they've sworn to be. So we want them to be that. We want them to know and demonstrate a proper allegiance to protecting Samuel here. Okay, to protecting the citizen. We want them to be moral men of good character and with a sober commitment to justice. And, and 1 Timothy 3, uh, verse 1 to 7 actually lay out the uh, qualifications for an elder in the church. In the early America, people couldn't be in civil government until they were, unless they were elders and, and respected in their church. Okay? So we want them to be that kind of man. We want them to be, be, have honesty, integrity, decency, honor. We want them to understand this doctrine of interposition and their important role and duty in it. Because they're our vehicle of interposition, are they not? We want, them, we want them to know world history and American history and the historical examples of interposition. We want them to demonstrate their knowledge by their commitment to voting against anything that violates biblical law or the Constitution. We want them to vote against those things. What do we want our lower magistrate to do? We just talked about what we want them to be, but in this, this bleeds over to what we want them to do. Like our founders, we want them to resist the lawlessness of the federal government. We want them to resist it. When, they, when the federal government turns around acting lawlessly with that sword, we want B to stand there 
and interpose on our behalf. We want, her to, we want them to know when that's happening. We want them to resist it. We want them to resist unlawful orders. We don't want them to vote for anything that's unlawful, even if it seems good. Even if it seems like a good idea. If it's not lawful, they shouldn't vote for it, even if it brings home the bacon. Bringing home the bacon isn't their job. It's not what they didn't swear an oath to bring home the bacon. They swore an oath to protect and defend the Constitution before God and to be our representatives. We want them to recognize the suffering of the people and recognize that their duty before God is not to the higher magistrate. He's not the law. When Matthew turns around there with his sword facing this way, he's not the law. The higher magistrate, uh, we, we, want, we want them basically to keep the higher magistrate on the civil wall, don't we? That's what we want them to do. And the first question should always be for any legislator or for any police officer or sheriff, any county council person, any local government official should always be, or any candidate should understand this. Whenever the state's get, gonna, getting ready to do anything, the first question should always be, where is the state's authority to do this thing? Where's the authority? Do we have the authority to do it? Okay, that was a lot of fun talking about who they should be and what they should do, right? But that's only the beginning. Who are we? What do we, what do, what do we need to be? What do we need to do? First of all, we need to understand everything we just said that they have to understand. We have to understand all of that stuff, and we don't. We've got the government we deserve because we don't understand these things. We haven't studied them. We don't even know what interposition is. We don't even understand it as a culture, okay? Now there's, now there's 60 people who have been introduced to it, or however many people are here, 90 people, whatever, that have been introduced to it. But it's not known in the culture. We have to make it known. We have to get, we have to do that. We need to be a moral people. John Adams again said this constitution was intended for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate for the governance of any other. We have to stop asking our leaders to be immoral. We have to stop asking them to do things because it fits our personal prerogative. We can't ask them to do unconstitutional things or immoral things. Stop asking them. You know, it's interesting. People, I've had people say, what if we just had term limits? Wouldn't, wouldn't that solve all this constitutional problem if we had term limits? We have term limits. We have term limits. Alex and Don are up, are, are, up, are up for election next year. There's a term limit. We're the ones not enforcing term limits. It's not them. Stop thinking like slaves. Stop demanding the government violate its jurisdiction for our perceived benefit. It's the great lie of socialism, the idea that we're going to get something for nothing. Stop believing and acting out the lie of socialism. It's sinful and it's anti-American. Start thinking like Americans again, incorporating the American view into our interaction with government and into our interaction with our fellow citizens. There is a God. Our rights come from him. The purpose of civil government is to protect and defend those rights. And our founders went on to say one more thing after that. They said, whenever any government doesn't do this, then you should alter or abolish it. Okay? But we need to first, we need to, we need to be moral people and stand behind our local magistrates, our lower magistrates, so that they can do this. There is a higher moral law. Moral law and a lawgiver, a creator God. We are privileged, ladies and gentlemen, to live in a country that was founded on the recognition of this truth. And as, our people, as a people, our righteous and truthful actions as citizens and as civil magistrates should reflect our gratitude for the faithfulness of our forebears and should direct our desires to pass these blessings of liberty onto our posterity. And for that, I thank you for your kind attention. Okay, well, <laughs> if you've never heard of interposition, or if you've heard of it and just didn't know exactly what it was, hopefully after that, you, uh, you know what interposition is and what we should be holding our elected officials to, to interpose on our behalf uh, f uh, against tyrannical government. And we've certainly seen uh, tyrannical government over the last couple
couple of years um, and longer than that, but most specifically the last couple of years. So hope, hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, you can um, purchase that through the store. There's a digital download. I believe it's $2. Um, and uh, you can get that uh, lecture um, for your own to keep and to, uh, to share with others. So um, I, that it never gets old. I, I don't know how many times I've seen it, but um, <laughs> Michael is just so right on. And by the way, Michael is running for attorney general in the state of Maryland. So all of those viewers that are in Maryland, um, if you weren't planning to, hopefully you will vote for uh, Michael for attorney general of Maryland. And uh, this is just another good reason why he understands the system of government that we were founded on and that we're supposed to be, um, uh, you know, under. And sadly, uh, in this day and age, we are not any longer. So, all right. If you have questions or comments, uh, you can put them uh, in the comments section. What I would suggest is waiting until after the live stream is done and then going to YouTube or if you're watching on um, uh, Facebook, uh, put your questions uh, in there and we'll try to, uh, to get back to you with, with answers. So um, next month, August, August 5th, uh, we're going to replay Article 5, Reigning in the Federal Government. And this is a lecture given by Ricky Pepin, who, uh, if you've been with us this summer, was the uh, our first speaker. She's our Dean of Instructors. Uh, and she gave a, a, a lecture on uh, Article 5 and the Electoral College. And uh, again, this is, um, this is good, important stuff. Um, you may be aware that people have been um, uh, talking about conservatives, Republicans have been um, talking about the idea of holding an Article 5 convention to, um, uh, to restore the Constitution or to, to deal with that. And there are um, good arguments on both sides, pro and con, uh, of having an Article 5 convention. And Ricky is going to look at those pros and cons in this lecture, Article 5, Reigning in the Federal Government. Um, and she also deals with the, the Electoral College and how it's supposed to be working, and which it isn't, of course, like most other things aren't. Um, so that's going to be Friday, August 5th. That's our, our next month, August 5th, uh, or August 1st Friday lecture. And again, these lectures are at 7 p.m. Eastern, which is 6 Central, which is 5 Mountain, and 4 Pacific. So um, if you want to catch it live as we're running it, um, you want to be able to do that. Of course, these are all recorded, and you can watch them at any time um, once, they've been, once they've been done. Let's have a word of prayer as we finish. Father God, we give you thanks for this day, Lord. We thank you for the American view of law and government. We thank you for our founders as they conceived through your inspiration uh, this form of government. We thank you that uh, Michael and others like him have uh, understood and studied, uh, studied this form of government and the history and our founding fathers and, and the writers of that time so that we can try and restore that form of government to uh, this country. Lord, we pray for the country. We pray for your divine providence over the country. And we pray for all of those uh, that would have ears to hear, that they would uh, hear this message, hear this word, and vote accordingly, Lord, and, and uh, bring back this American view of law and government, which we, have, uh, which we are losing at this point. Now, Father, we pray for the rest of the evening, and in all things, we commit ourselves to you, and we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, again, thanks for being here, and come back next month, August 5th, for uh, Ricky Pepin's Article 5, Reigning in the Federal Government. God bless you, and have a wonderful night.